Hey, my name is Zach and I am an associate pastor here at The Crossing Church and I have the duty today of, of moving us from our last series, Practicing the Way of Jesus, into the Christmas season. But I've got that awkward Sunday right before Christmas really starts and Thanksgiving's already over. And so today we're doing a one-off. We're going to talk about Jonah. So let's just kind of dive right in. In 1993, the course of Christianity was forever shifted in the same magnitude as Calvin, Wesley, Aquinas, and Augustine of Hippo because that was the year that Veggie Tales launched, a show dedicated to teaching kids about morality and retelling Bible stories with a cast of characters consisting entirely of fruits and vegetables. Now, if you're a millennial or you raised a millennial in a Christian context, you're probably already familiar with Veggie Tales, but one of the things that it's really well known for is its excellent music. Perhaps you've heard some of the great hits, such as His Cheeseburger, The Pirates Who Don't Do Anything, Where Is My Hairbrush, and the one that started it all, The Water Buffalo Song. <laughs> and if you're familiar with my personal email address, by the way, you'll know that that song in particular had a very large impact in my life. <laughs> in 2002, Veggie Tales launched their first ever full-length film, Jonah an endeavor that actually bankrupt them, rest in pieces. And in that movie, there is this song that continues to haunt me to this very day. I'll be sitting down and studying or just resting, trying to sleep, and at the back of my mind marches in this little ditty. Jonah was a prophet, ooh, ooh, but he really never got it. Sad but true, and it just, it just loops. Jonah was a prophet, ooh, ooh, and it just goes on and on and on forever until the heat death of the universe. And while the film itself is not a perfect representation of the theological nuances of the book of Jonah, you know what? They really nailed the song. <laughs> if I had to describe Jonah, these are the two things I would say. Number one, Jonah was a prophet of God. Number two, he never really got it. <laughs> he was bad at being a prophet. Today we're going to examine just how bad. He was at it. And we're actually going to read the entirety of the book of Jonah. It's an endeveor that took Veggie Tales an hour and a half, but today it's only going to take us six minutes. It's a short book, so let's just kind of go right into it. Here we go. The Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amittai. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it because I have seen how wicked its people are. But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. He went down to the port of Joppa, where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. He bought a ticket and went on board, hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. But the Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm that threatened to break the ship apart. Fearing for their lives, the desperate sailors shouted to their gods for help and threw the cargo overboard to lighten the ship. But all this time, Jonah was sound asleep down in the hold. So the captain went down after him. How can you sleep at a time like this? He shouted. Get up, pray to your God. Maybe he will pay attention to us and spare our lives. Then the crew cast lots to see which of them had offended the gods and caused the terrible storm. When they did this, the lots identified Jonah as the culprit. Why has this awful storm come down on us? They demanded. Who are you? What is your line of work? What country are you from? What is your nationality? Jonah answered, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the land. The sailors were terrified when they heard this for he had already told them he was running away from the Lord. Oh, why did you do this? They groaned. And since the storm was getting worse all the time, they asked him, what should we do to you to stop this storm? Throw me into the sea, Jonah said, and it will become calm again. I know that this terrible storm is all my fault. Instead, the sailors rowed even harder to get the ship to the land, but the stormy sea was too violent for them and they couldn't make it. Then they cried out to the Lord, Jonah's God. Oh Lord, they pleaded, don't make us die for this man's sin and don't hold us responsible for his death. Oh Lord, you have sent this storm upon him for your own good reasons. Then the sailors picked Jonah up and threw him into the raging sea and the storm stopped at once. The sailors were awestruck by the Lord's great power 
and they offered him a sacrifice and vowed to serve him. Now the Lord had arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from inside the fish. He said, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble, and he answered me. I called to you from the land of the dead, and Lord, you heard me. You threw me into the ocean depths, and I sank down to the heart of the sea. The mighty waters engulfed me, and I was buried beneath your wild and stormy waves. Then I said, O oh Lord, you have driven me from your presence, yet I will look once more toward your holy temple. I sank beneath the waves, and the waters closed over me. Seaweed wrapped itself around my head. I sank down to the very roots of the mountains. I was imprisoned in the earth, whose gates locked shut forever. But you, O oh Lord, my God, snatched me from the jaws of death. As my life was slipping away, I remembered the Lord, and my earnest prayer went out to you in your holy temple. Those who worship false gods turn their backs on all God's mercies, but I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise, and I will fulfill all my vows, for my salvation comes from the Lord alone. Then the Lord ordered the fish to spit Jonah out onto the beach. Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. <laughs> Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message I have given you. This time, Jonah obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh, a city so large that it took three days to see it all. On the day Jonah entered the city, he shouted to the crowds, Forty days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. The people of Nineveh believed God's message, and from the greatest to the least, they declared a fast and put on burlap to show their sorrows. When the king of Nineveh heard that what Jonah was saying, he stepped down from his throne and took off his royal robes. He dressed himself in burlap and sat on a heap of ashes. Then the king and his nobles sent this decree throughout the city. No one, not even the animals from your herds and flocks, may eat or drink anything at all. People and animals alike must wear garments of mourning, and everyone must pray earnestly to God. They must turn from their evil ways and stop all their violence. Who can tell? Perhaps, even yet, God will change his mind and hold back his fierce anger from destroying us. When God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. This change of plans greatly upset Jonah, and he became very angry. So he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? <laughs> That is why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew, I knew that you were a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn back from destroying people. Just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. The Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry about this? Then Jonah went out to the east side of the city and made a shelter to sit under as he waited to see what would happen in the city. And the Lord God arranged for a leafy plant to grow there, and, and soon it spread its broad leaves over Jonah's head, shading him from the sun. This eased his discomfort, and Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But God also arranged for a worm. The next morning at dawn, the worm ate through the stem of the plant so that it withered away. And as the sun grew hot, God arranged for a scorching east wind to blow on Jonah. The sun beat down on his head until he grew faint and wished to die. Death is certainly better than living like this, he exclaimed. Then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? Yes, Jonah retorted, even angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you feel sorry about the plant, though you did nothing to put it there. It came quickly and died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? There it is. That's the whole book of Jonah. That may be the longest stretch of scripture we've done. <laughs> the faithless prophet Jonah. And when we approach scripture, um, it's tempting to come at it kind of grimly, very solemnly. Oh, 
But in reality, uh, we're supposed to read the book of Jonah kind of like an SNL sketch, Saturday Night Live. It's a story that is blown wildly out of proportion. Everything is upside down, expectations are subverted, and it ends with a punchline that we'll get to in just a minute. So to illustrate this SNL point, look, look at these opening lines. The Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amitai. Amitai, in Hebrew, means faithful. <laughs> Jonah, son of faithful, receives a word from the Lord, and we see exactly how the son of faithful responds, don't we? These kind of things keep happening throughout the entire story. We, we keep shaking our head and saying, oh, Jonah, what a dum-dum. <laughs> what a fool. Now, any good preacher at this point would say something like, be careful, we all act like Jonah sometimes. And I would say that now, except that the author has beat me to the punch. The book ends with this unanswered question. Jonah never responds to it. And the reason for that is because the question is not for Jonah. The question is for the reader. The author does a Deadpool and breaks the fourth wall and all but says, dear reader, you are Jonah. Ouch. <laughs> this must be one of those bad SNL sketches. <laughs> not, not funny, not funny. <laughs> so, so far today we've learned two things. The first, from scripture, we are Jonah. And the second, from VeggieTales, Jonah never really got it. <laughs> so this leads us to the central question today, which is this. How do we get it? Do we get it? Do we understand who God is? Are we following in his ways? We're going to look at Jonah's non-examples, and my hope is that by the end of today we'll have a clearer picture of what it looks like to seek and to follow Jesus. First observation, Jonah flees from God's mission. Now, uh, this point is pretty obvious, right? There's no metaphor here. He literally gets up and ships out. <laughs> But, 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 it's bigger than that, right? There's a trope in scripture called the reluctant prophet, and we see this over and over again. God calls someone to greatness, and they push back on their call. All right, Moses resists uh, uh, saying that he stutters, so God should really use someone else to free the nation of Israel. Gideon requires not one, but two miracles before he's going to kind of move forward. You know, pushing back on God's mission is a normal, albeit regrettable, human reaction. Praise God that he is persistent and keeps inviting us back. <laughs> so, so here's the SNL moment, all right? So what's expected is that Jonah, son of faithful, will push back, perhaps argue a bit with God, uh, and then eventually he'll go, you know, just like all the other prophets that God has called. But instead, what we get is a blown out of proportion, mad dash for the beach. Jonah vanishes. He vanishes. There's no back and forth. He's just gone, just like Batman. Gone where, though? Why Tarshish? All right, well, let's take a look at this map. Uh, on the right is Joppa, the port that Jonah is using to flee. Uh, Nineveh is to the east, and Tarshish is to the far west, uh, as far west as you can go. <laughs> but beyond being physically distant, the city of Tarshish was used as a stand-in for a, a foreign, exotic, faraway place. Um, this would also be a faithful translation. But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. He went down to the port of Joppa where he found a ship leaving for Timbuktu. Right? As far as you can go. The point is, Jonah is not fleeing to something. Right? He's fleeing from something. There's nothing waiting for him in Tarshish. And in fact, that's his exact hope, that there's nothing waiting for him in Tarshish. Anywhere but here, he says. Um, in, in my head canon, Jonah's devotional reading on the way to Joppa uh, would be from Psalm 139, uh, which, which reads this. Just imagine this as he's walking to the shore. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest ocean, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I remember, I imagine him reading that and you're like, oh, this is good stuff. As he goes to the port of Joppa. So Jonah flees, but the story is even more nuanced, okay? So hidden within the Hebrew narrative is a wordplay that, again, showcases Jonah's mindset here. In Hebrew, Jonah goes down to Joppa, down into the ship, down into the hold. And that word hold in Hebrew, it's a very clunky, 
term. The term is yarkate hesefina. Yarkate hesefina. There are other phrases that do a better job of explaining like what the hold of a ship is, but the author is not doing a bad job writing. Rather, the author is contrasting this phrase with another common phrase, yarkate hatsafon. Yarkate hatsafon. So yarkate hatsafon is a high holy point, a place where heaven and earth meet. It's Mount Zion. It's, it's Eden. Right? When you go ascend Yarkate Hatzafon, you are in the presence of God. You're in tune with his mission. God has invited Jonah to join him in paradise. Up, up, up to Yarkate Hatzafon. Jonah's response? Down, down, down to Yarkate Hatzafina, a paradise of his own making. And that, folks, is the human condition. Instead of joining God in what is good, we make our own good. And in the process, we miss the point completely. Here's the deal. Um, when God invites us to join him in his mission, uh, we have two choices. We can embrace it or we can flee. We can embrace it or we can flee. And here's the rub. Sometimes the second option uh, isn't actually an option. <laughs> it certainly wasn't for Jonah. In fact, the story plays out in a very SNL kind of way. All right, so, so check this out. The name Nineveh comes from the Akkadian word Nina. Uh, Nina, which was a goddess whose sign was a fish. Uh, there's on the screen a, a, a little symbol in Akkadian, and I'm told that the clump in the middle is, is red as fish. I don't read cuneiform, Akkadian cuneiform. Maybe you do. Fact check me. Jonah was called to a journey for three days in the depths of Fish City, Nineveh, Fish City. And upon his refusal, God arranged for Jonah to journey three days into a different kind of fishy place. <laughs> That's funny. That's rich. <laughs> it's like an SNL sketch. All right, we know that, that Jonah flees from God's mission. But we also see the second observation, which is that Jonah fakes his fear of the Lord. Jonah flees from God's mission, and Jonah fakes his fear of the Lord. Now, we use the New Living Translation here at The Crossing because it does a good job of merging uh, faithful interpretation and readability. There's no single translation that's the best. Uh, in fact, this is what we say, the best translation is the one that you actually sit down and read. But there's this theme in Jonah about the fear of the Lord, which is not really as clear in the NLT because it translates fear as worship, um, which is a fine translation. Uh, it just doesn't quite carry all the implications of fear that we need to explore this theme. Um, and we don't have time today to really explore and delve into the nuances of the fear of the Lord. Uh, that would be a great sermon series. A great, uh, it would probably take a whole series. Uh, but to get us into the right headspace, let me just read a quote from C.S. Lewis in which he talks about Aslan, the God figure in the Chronicles of Narnia. He paints this image of what fear of the Lord looks like just really well. It, this is what he says. Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Oh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, says Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. That's a beautiful imagery of, of what the fear of God looks like. And so now that we're in that headspace, uh, to help illustrate that theme, I'm going to switch to a word-for-word -word translation. It's a little bit clunky. It's not quite as smooth, but it gets the idea across. So if you feel like the words are weird, that's on purpose. Don't worry. Um, so in the story, the ships are in the midst of a, the ship is in the great, midst of a great storm. And the sailors have discovered that this storm is on account of Jonah. So they ask him, who are you? And his response is, I am a Hebrew, and I fear Yahweh, Elohim of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Now let's step back from the story for a second. Who are the characters in Jonah? All right, we've got the supposed antagonists, the, the wicked and evil Ninevites. We have the sailors who are pagans, and they cry out to their various gods. I guess if we're being technical, we've got the big fish and the mean worm <laughs> who don't like have any speaking parts, but I assume that they're not Hebrew. They at least don't claim to be. And then we have Jonah, the only character that claims to follow and fear Yahweh, the one true God. There's only one person who makes this claim, and it's, it's Jonah. If we look at the casts, we can place everyone into this chart. On the left, we have those who fear God, and the right, we have those who don't. But let's do some investigation to make sure that our chart is accurate, right? Because this is just based on what they've claimed. So the Ninevites, let's start with them. Um, they live in Nineveh. 
Duh. God himself describes the place as wicked. Jonah 1 verse 2, and this is the clunky one. Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Right? In English, this word great can have implications of goodness, but don't worry. In Hebrew, it's just referring to size. So it's a wicked place. It's a large city chock full of wicked people. And in fact, the only other time that we see this phrase, Nineveh, the great city, uh, it appears in Genesis 10. It's a hyperlink right back to Genesis 10. And as it turns out, it's one of the cities that Nimrod forms. Uh, maybe you're more familiar with the sister city, Babylon. Not a good place. There's no doubt that at the beginning of the story, uh, they belong in the column on the right. But when we're actually introduced to the people, here's what they do. This is chapter 3, verse 5. Once again, the Kunki translation. And the men of Nineveh believed in Elohim. Elohim means God. Um, and they called out a fast, and they were washed or clothed with sackcloth from the great of them to the small of them. Then on to verses 6 through 9. And the word reached to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he removed his robe from upon him, and he covered with sackcloth, and he sat in the dust, and he cried out, and he said, In Nineveh, from order of the king and his great ones, saying, The human and the beast, the cattle and the flock, don't let them taste anything. Don't let them graze. Don't let them drink water, and let them cover themselves with sackcloth. The human and the beast, and let them call out to Elohim with force. And let each man turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? The Elohim may turn to repent and turn from the heat of his anger so that we will not perish. And those words are clunky, but man, they do a good job of conveying that, that urgency. The, and this, and this, and this, and I don't know. Who knows? Let's just put the animals in burlap too, just to cover our bases. <laughs> it's, it's clear that Nineveh has a change of heart. They fear the Lord. And so we have to move them from one column to the other in the chart. But what about the sailors? All right, their, their transformation is actually even more obvious. They start with a general fear in verse 5. This is what the clunky translation says. And the sailors feared and each cried to his Elohim. That's, remember, that's a general term for God. It's not calling to Yahweh. They're calling just to their gods. But their fear finds the correct focus the moment Jonah tells them that Yahweh is the source. Here's verse 10. And the men feared a great fear. Um, then when it became clear that, that the only option was to throw Jonah into the sea, uh, they pray to Yahweh. The, the pagans pray to Yahweh. This is verse 14. Please, Yahweh, do not let us perish on account of this man's life, and don't set innocent blood against us. For you, Yahweh, have done as you pleased. Then the storm stops, and here's what they say in, in verse 16. This, this is great. Then the men feared Yahweh a great fear, <laughs> and they offered sacrifices to Yahweh, and they vowed vows. They feared Yahweh a great fear. Now, here's what's interesting about the sacrifices and the vows. Um, these are things that couldn't have been done on the ship. All right? These are things that had to be done on the land, just from the logistics of it. So we see that their fear of the Lord is lasting. Right? I mean, this is a conversion. And, and sure, it's the power of the storm that initiates the fear, but it's not what sustains it. It's not what sustains it. Yahweh is what sustains it. And so they fear the Lord. And so we have to move them over to the other column. Now with Jonah and the Ninevites. So we got the enemies of God, the Ninevites. They fear him. We got the pagan sailors who commit their lives to him and fear Yahweh a great fear. All right, let's talk about the fish and the worm. Why not? Uh, and while we're at it, we'll include the hot east wind in the fourth chapter, because it's, it's, it's there. And while not sentient, uh, you'll notice they're all appointed by Yahweh. They're all commanded by Yahweh. Um, they're sent to do his bidding, and they do it. And I get this is ridiculous because, like, of course, what are they going to do? Is the fish going to flee to Tarshish? No, well, may maybe, no. Um, but check out the extent of this idea. The author really expands on this idea. Chapter 1, verse 4. This is crazy, guys. And Yahweh hurled a great wind to the sea, and there was a great storm on the sea, and, check it, the ship considered breaking apart. The ship considered it. This was an intentional choice of words. The ship considered it. Even the ship becomes a temporary character in this story, and in its brief moment of literary sentience, it has a healthy fear of God. <laughs> and so we see that all creation fears the Lord. In fact, every single character in the story fears Yahweh. You know who doesn't? Jonah. <laughs> that great storm that proved to be a life-changing catalyst for a crew of sailors, 
you know, it didn't impress Jonah. Uh, in fact, before they throw Jonah into the ocean, the first thing they try to do, I don't know if you noticed this, is, is to row him back to shore. But it doesn't work. And the question I have is, why doesn't that work, right? I mean, that would be achieving the objectives that God wants. Jonah's going to go then go on a journey to Nineveh. But here's what I think, and this is just speculation, um, but I'm not speculating alone. Some other people think this as well. Returning to the shore didn't work because Jonah hadn't actually changed his mind. It didn't work because the storm didn't impress him. He hadn't changed his mind. He suggests being thrown into the sea, not because he's acting as some brave sacrifice, but because he prefers death over following God's plan. Jonah prefers death over following God's plan. Check out what he says when he's in the belly of the fish. This is uh, chapter 2, verse 9. But I, with a voice of thanksgiving, I will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay in full. Rescue belongs to Yahweh. Now this sounds really nice, but notice the difference between Jonah and the sailors. In chapter 1, it describes what they did. They sacrificed sacrifices and vowed, vowed. That this, this is a past tense thing, it's something I did. In this chapter, Jonah is making a promise of what he will do, a promise that remains unfulfilled in the telling of this story. Jonah is, as it seems, all talk. So we have to move him to the other column. <laughs> and now our fears God and doesn't fear column, God looks a little column looks a little bit different. All right, uh, let's recap. Jonah flees from God's mission. That's his first problem. Jonah fakes his fear of the Lord. That's his second problem. Observation number three. Jonah fights against God's goals. As the story progresses, it becomes clear to Jonah that the only path forward is God's path. And in fact, I, I hope you notice this on your read-through, uh, but chapter three serves as a reset of the story. Get up and go, God says. Again. <laughs> <laughs> and so Jonah, left with no other options, goes to the great city Nineveh. Nineveh, a city so great that it takes three days to walk through. This is chapter 3, verse 4, the clunky translation again. And, and Jonah began to, Yonah is Jonah, and Jonah began to go into the city a walking of one day. And he called out and he said, 40 days and Nineveh is overturned. Then Jonah went into the city a walking of another day and he called, sorry? Oh, it doesn't say that. Oh, that's not there. I made that up. That's right. That's crazy because there's no way that my man Jonah walks down a few city blocks and then he leaves. I mean, come on. The king didn't even hear it from Jonah. He heard it through the grapevine. <laughs> Let's pretend for a second that NASA discovers that a world-ending asteroid is coming straight for the planet. And they just don't bother telling the White House. They don't bother with it. Washington only finds out about it after Elon Musk tweets about how SpaceX has launched a rocket to try to apprehend the coming rock. I mean, Jonah is purposely setting up Nineveh for failure. Jonah wants a firestorm. Then there's the content of his message. It's six words in the clunky translation, and it's only five words in Hebrew. Here they are, are you ready? Don't blink. 40 days and Nineveh is overturned. Six words. <laughs> What's missing from the message? Well, for one, who is overturning Nineveh? Unlike the sailors, the Ninevites don't have the privilege of knowing which God is going to do this. All right, the sailors cry out to Yahweh. The Ninevites, they cry out to Elohim, which remember is the generic term for God. They aren't sure. They assume it's Jonah's God, but the, who is that? <laughs> Jonah doesn't bother telling them. He doesn't clarify. Beyond that, uh, Jonah leaves out the part where they can repent, which is a key part of the message. I mean, think about this for a second, guys. Think about this. Pharaoh, Pharaoh of Egypt, enemy of God's children, had 10 chances to change his mind before God would destroy Egypt. All right? if, if Jonah had his way, Nineveh would have zero. Just to solidify this point, like here's what the king says in chapter 3, verse 9, and we're back to the NLT again. Phew, it's easier to read. Who can tell? Perhaps even yet God, and in Hebrew that's the Elohim because they don't know, will change his mind and hold back his fierce anger from destroying us. Who can tell? Jonah can tell. Jonah could have told them. He should have told them. And it's not like he didn't know. Chapter 4, verse 2, Jonah's arguing with God. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? 
That is why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn back from destroying people. Jonah knew. Jonah knew. But Jonah wanted to accomplish his own goals. And his own goals involved the destruction of Nineveh. And God's goals just didn't really fit into Jonah's agenda. Jonah had a problem with the tension between God's justice and God's mercy. And by the way, just a reminder, we are Jonah. When it comes to this area, we are self-centered, right? Mercy for me, justice for thee. Nothing I do is that bad, but those guys, whew, they need to be brought to justice. And I, I want to be clear, Nineveh ultimately repents from their repentance. Um, and what I mean by that is they actually ultimately go back to their evil ways and they're punished for it. So ultimately, on the grand scale timeline, God's justice prevails. So in that sense, Jonah is right. But the thing is, guys, it's not Jonah's call. It's not Jonah's call. And it's not your call either. It's God's call. Jonah may hate Nineveh, but God has a heart for the Ninevites. That, makes, that much is made clear in chapter 4. In fact, look at the closing verse. This is, this is the question that's actually posed to us, the readers. This is what it says. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who don't know their right hand from their left, not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? I mean, what God is saying is, look, Joe, these guys don't have the covenant promises, right? They don't have the guidances that you have. They don't have the law. They aren't in the family of Abraham. They aren't God's chosen people. So shouldn't I repent that, that, or rejoice that these guys who have so much stacked against them are eager to repent? <laughs> and then here's the, the really wild part, right? That 120,000 number, it's not listed the normal way. It's listed as a math equation, 12 times 10,000. And if you were here for our Revelation series, I hope that that's ringing a bell for you. And that's because this is one of the ways that the Bible notates the family of God. It's the 12 tribes of Israel times a bunch, times a myriad. In essence, um, what God is saying is that they're a part of the family, but they just don't know it yet. They're a part of the human project. Jonah, the Ninevites are made in my image. Oh man, friends, don't fight God's goals. We can't see the full picture. We can't fully see what's good. That leads us back then to the central question. How do we get it? All right, how do we get it? If Jonah is the example of what not to do, how do we become anti-Jonahs? Well, let's look. So Jonah flees from the purposes of God. When God invites him up, 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 he goes down, down, down. Anti-Jonahs follow God's pathways. They trust that God's ways are greater. Jonah fakes his belief in God. He talks a good talk, but it's all lip service. Anti-Jonahs fear the Lord, right? We believe in God, we pursue God, and we understand who he is. He's the king, I tell you. Jonah fights the goals of Yahweh, right? When it became clear that he had no other options, he chose to place his own ideas first. Anti-Jonahs form their own objectives in the light of the kingdom of God. All right, they prayed Jesus' prayer, not my will, but yours be done. I love how the poet Thomas John Carlyle puts it. And Jonah stalked to his shaded seat and waited for God to come around to his way of thinking. And God is still waiting for a host of Jonahs in their comfortable homes to come around to his way of loving. <laughs> Jonah was a prophet, ooh, ooh, but he really never got it. How about you? God, we ask that you will help us get it. <laughs> we don't want to be like Jonah, but God, we are like Jonah. and. Um, I pray that you will guide us as we continue to pursue you in, in our lives, that you will shape our, our pathways, that you will encourage us to, to walk down the paths you've laid in front of us, no matter how uncomfortable we feel. 
And God, I, I pray that, that, that you will help our, our fear of you be authentic, right? That there's more than just a worship, more than just a respect, but there is this fear because you are God. And so I pray that we will recognize that and, and that we will follow you authentically. And God, I ask that as we go through our lives with our goals intact, that, that we will refashion our goals so that they match up with your goals. God, this is our prayer today. Hear us. In your name we pray. Amen. We'll see you next time.